Welcome, welcome to Radha. So today we are sitting with Radha Badwaj, and uh, she is an advocate for food security in York Region. Uh, she's also the social service uh, 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 facilitator at the Social Service Worker Program at Seneca College, uh, and she does mental health interventions uh, and is also the founder of Banyan Tree Circle. Uh, so I'm super excited, Radha, just to hear about your story because your experience with food is so vast and it spans from continents <laughs> and in all different capacities. Uh, I know that you're passionate about yoga and food and cooking and food security. And so I'm really excited to hear what you have to share with us today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine, for having me um, as part of your wonderful, um, you know, food stories space. I know it's a really, um, it's a really valuable one to consider within our communities right now to think about all the diverse experiences people have with food, right? And food is such a big um, conversation in, uh, in our communities right now. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's it. So food, with food story, stories, uh, we just look at food from so many different lenses, like you just said. So it's whether if you're a business owner, um, a restaurateur, a caterer, you have a product, or if you've just been involved in the food scene in any kind of way, then this is what we want to share those stories with everybody. So mm -hmm. amazing. So why don't we get started? Okay, so just to, as our starting point, um, I'm curious, I just want to know a little bit about you. So outside of yourself in the food scene, who is Rada? <laughs> Where are you from? What's your background? What would you like to share? Um, so I have a pretty sort of checkered um, background. Um, I was born in India, in Goa. And when I was about four or so, my family, my father and my mother moved to, um, to East Africa. So I have an older brother, so they moved their entire family to Tanzania. My father was a professor, um, you know, and uh, he was um, working on um, small industry, small farming development uh, related projects in India. And so he was seconded. Um, to go to Tanzania. And Tanzania at that time, uh, you know, was going through a socialist sort of revival. And uh, so they had invited um, people from, from India where there were, you know, common kind of uh, rural development projects that were happening. And so my father was one of the people seconded from, from India to go and support uh, rural development in Tanzania. So we always lived on campus in very rural communities. And so that was sort of, and then I grew up in Tanzania and then we later moved to Kenya. And so most of my early 20 years of my life uh, was spent growing up in East Africa. And uh, so all my early education, um, my high school education, some of my post-secondary education, all happened uh, in that context. And I came to Canada as, um, an, as an adult and went to school here. So I did both my uh, postgraduate degrees here at the University of Toronto and at the University of Waterloo. And so, you know, but the first 20 years of my life, which were sort of very core and very tethered um, to uh, cultures that were not from here, right? So I, I grew up there and um, had a very wonderful life. Um, so food, um, you know, in relation to food, food was always a very important theme, you know, in, in my childhood years, because when we arrived in East Africa, in Tanzania, President Nyerere at that time was, as I said, taking the country post-colonization towards self-reliance. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the political understanding at that time was this concept in Swahili called Ujama. And Ujama is um, essentially, um, you know, it's sort of, you know, relearning traditional farming methods, really talking about collectivism, which okay. I think through colonization and so on, um, 
uh, you know, the communities lost. They lost their connections to land. Uh, everything was being industrialized, you know, and so um, the concept of Ujama was basically saying we need to kind of go back to collective farming and go back to uh, self-reliance and kind of reclaim some of the disrupted agricultural practices that had been there before that time. So, you know, I grew up around a lot of gardens, you know, so my my earliest memories were of, you know, having a school garden in my elementary school where we all went and we dug and we planted and we weeded. It was actually part of our curriculum. Mm -hmm. the same thing was in high school, uh, we yeah. had a, a garden in high school, you know, and so we would go and, you know, dig and, you know, plant. And then we sold some of the produce to a community and the funds went back into the school. And so... Wow. What those were really sort of very, very foundational understandings around food. And unlike a lot of young people here, you know, I have a daughter who is, you know, uh, a young woman in her 20s. Um, you know, folks here don't, young children and adults don't really, they're so, we're so disconnected from land, right? Like we're not really in our day-to-day -day urban lives, really spending time with the earth. You know, we're not really spending time growing our own vegetables or growing our own, um, you know, our own food. And so a lot of times people don't really know what, 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 you know, what it takes to grow carrots or to grow potatoes or to grow peaches or whatever, unless you're really, you know, involved in farming, um, you know, farming communities or you come from a home where farming was part of your life. But for me, uh, and for a lot of people who grew up in Tanzania in the 70s, you know, that was just part of what we did. You know, all my aunties, black and brown, had kitchen gardens. And, you know, I remember my mom and my, you know, aunties, my all my other mothers who raised me would be outside. It was a communal activity. The food was shared. So they grew things like okra. They grew things like, um, you know, beans and, um, you know, collard greens and all kinds of things because some of the aunties came from West Africa. And so right. I remember Auntie Marion, you know, growing these really wicked hot peppers from, you know, <laughs> from West Africa, from Sierra Leone. And then she would cook us this yam stew with, with a lot of this really hot pepper in it, you know. Um, so food was very, very important uh, for, for, for me as a child. Um, very very important part of my life and then I, I moved here to Canada in uh you know uh, in the 80s and you know what? Uh, can I so Rada can I ask um just before we get to uh moving to Canada because there's so much like richness and and uh like just so much meat in what you're talking about about your mm -hmm. experience living in East Africa I just want to spend a little bit more time there um because mm -hmm. it's it's just really so it seems like um, you know, from an early age, like food sovereignty is at the core of, of like who you are and how you operate in the world. Um, so I find that very interesting. And, and just the, the, how you brought about the, um, like how everyone had a garden and it was just such a core part of not only like your personal family's life, but about the whole culture. Um, and, and as part of like education for that connection piece, it really, um, mirrors like sort of how 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 you've how you've sort of progressed <laughs> um and your yeah. your passions in life like it, it kind of really marries that and so yeah. i guess my okay go ahead i was just gonna say uh maxine that you know uh living in a socialist country what it also meant was that we were you know we were all you know um we didn't have a lot, you know, we didn't have a lot of stuff. We didn't have a lot of things and we didn't have a lot of things actually to even buy because nothing really was really available, you know, like there was not a lot of commercialization, um, uh, not a lot of corporatization of, of, uh, of um, you know, land and, and products and all of that. We weren't exposed to all of that. And so growing up, uh, you know, the idea of communityism, you know, was a really important one. And you have to remember the 70s were also a time in, 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 on the continent of Africa where there was a lot of conversation around 
um, apartheid in, in South Africa. And it was a time when um, Nelson Mandela and the ANC were really kind of uh, agitating about the apartheid in the community and in, in, in within South Africa. And all, all the countries um, were fairly new post-colonization, you know? And so the conversations were very, very rich around self-reliance and also collectivism and connecting people to each other. So for example, when um, uh, Mandela talked about Ubuntu, you know, he was really speaking about I am because we are, you know? And so we're very, like my experiences are very much tied to the well-being of someone else's experience. And the same thing was happening in Kenya, where we went later, where um, Ze Kenyatta, who was, you know, who led Kenya to independence, was talking about concepts like Harambe, which is, again, this notion, um, you know, of let's all pull together to support each other, you know? And so that was very much a core ethic and value that ran through my childhood. And it was not just reflected back at me from my immediate family, because they were expatriates, you know, from that country, but it was reflected back at me from everyone around, you know? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. all, um, you know, all the people who were living around us, you know, whether they were from Tanzania or they were from different parts, other parts of, you know, of West Africa or, or even Central Africa or even outside of, you know, Africa, all, you know, completely, the conversations were very much about how do we collectively improve our communities? How do we use, you know, uh, go back to some of the indigenous um, um, agricultural practices um, and really thinking through, um, you know, the reciprocity that we have with land, you know, where if we take care of the earth, the earth will take care of us, you know? Right, And right. in Kenya too, there were conversations as I was growing up as a teenager um, around deforestation. For example, Bangari Mazai at that time was really speaking about, you know, why the, the life of the forest is intimately connected to the life of a woman because women were the ones who were bringing water to, to farm their lands and, you know, raising crops that really fed their children. Um, and if there were no trees, there'd be no water. And so women would have to travel a lot farther to get the water and bring okay. it back, you know? And so all of these conversations were very much a part of my um, early years. Yes. And I mean, and not, and, and not just in East Africa, but, you know, we also, you know, came from, um, a very middle class uh, family and so whenever we visited my grandmother in India you know her house was set in the middle of trees you know we had neem trees and coconut trees and mango trees and um, you know and so the food from those kind of gooseberry trees were being used for pickles or you know the, mm. the mangoes were being used for cooking you know in the house and so it was a very much that kind of idea of you are you are very much part of what's around you and yeah. um, and that they're living things that we have to take care of right like the idea that an old tree has you know just as much right to live on this earth as you do if not more right and that it's an ancient tree that's a sentient being that understanding was very much uh, shared with me at very very young age and you know I do want to emphasize this idea of community which you know is really important you know um, yeah. because I think what has happened you know is that we've allowed ourselves to you know move away from our relationships with, with nature and therefore we don't have relationships with each other because I think they're so tied Right. So absolutely. Absolutely. Like you bring up so many really interesting points, the points of self-reliance, the, self, the point of like when we take care of each other, there is the ability for everyone to thrive. Um, and it's more reflective, which I found um, speaking to many different people throughout the continent of Africa, there's more of a communal worldview as opposed mm -hmm. to an individualistic worldview. Um, mm -hmm which is kind of like what happened with colonization is everyone was becoming yeah. their own island. Everything is separate. 
so I, I really um, am intrigued by the idea that in order to rebuild the community, uh, rebuild the uh, country's post-colonial um, settlements, that what came back was that communal perspective of things um, and that yeah. relationship uh, to food, the environment, to one another as a way of strengthening. Yes, yeah. yes. And I mean, I teach as, you know, as you said at the start of um, this uh, conversation, you mentioned that, you know, I'm a professor at Seneca College, which is not too far from me. And uh, one of the courses I teach is, you know, is within the Bachelor of Community Mental Health Programs. And it's around food insecurity, you know. Okay. And um, in having some of those conversations with my students, you know, I realize how, um, how inaccessible some of these conversations are around food. And, and food accessibility is such a huge issue for post-secondary students in our, in our communities, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think two in five of our, you know, post-secondary students are living in extremely insecure um, and unsustainable food situations, you know, because the cost of, you know, uh, post-secondary education is so high, housing is so expensive. So mm -hmm. all of these things kind of lead to people literally living out of boxes or, you know, uh, you know, cooking sort of microwave meals and just surviving really and not thriving. And so when I teach in the classes around food insecurity, um, I really try to bring in uh, the Europe Region Food Network to really speak about, you know, your community gardens, um, you know, the food, the, you know, the community kitchen, uh, you know, programming that you do there, because mm -hmm. I want the students to really understand that food is medicine, right? Yeah, Mental yeah. health is very much tied to how we eat and you know what we're using i mean you know you talked about um me practicing yoga well part of yoga and yoga philosophy is also ayurveda you know which is basically using food to heal yourself you know right. and and that is an indigenous concept that's not it's universal you know if you if you talk to indigenous communities here or on the continent of africa people are going to tell you the same thing because that's what I saw, you know. Um, people would have, you know, specific foods that they ate during the day or and during the night. And, you know, if you were ill, certain herbs would be used in the food and certain body types would have certain kinds of food. So you're not increasing, you know, too much heat in your body or too much cooling, you know. So these kinds of understanding are very, very ancient. and so kind of bringing that back to people and saying, well, you know, in terms of time and resources, yes, it's a very difficult time for students who are in post-secondary education and right. juggling so many priorities. However, food can be accessible, you know, like we can actually, uh, you know, use whatever we have and create a, re a really healthy meal for ourselves and it can be very healing. You know, the yes, uh, yes. process of cooking can be very healing. Cooking collectively and having relationship with food that's healthy can be really healing. And mm -hmm. we have to really teach our young people this. Um, we have to teach them at a very early age. We have to talk about it. We have to, you know, we have to learn from, uh, from each other, you know. And, and that's really important, I think, for me. And I try to bring that into my classrooms as well. knowing. Yeah knowing that it's a privileged conversation sometimes yeah. right like it is yeah. can be really privileged like when you're talking about uh, food to a young woman who's also a single mom who's trying to pay her rent and pay her school fees you know food sometimes you know a lot of people will have food for the children but may go without food themselves because right, yeah. they don't have that right so yeah. how do we collectively take care of each other and one mm -hmm. of the things we're trying to do at Seneca College at the King Campus mm -hmm. is we spent a year sort of advocating for, um, um, you know, for food resources at, at the school. And we also have decided to collaborate with the landscaping uh, faculty and, and build a community garden, a healing garden, 
which mm -hmm. will help us to, you know, plant and dig and sort of take care of our health and also use the produce to create a good food box program for people to take home some vegetables through sort of the fall uh, wow. semester. Um, so we're trying to put that in place. And of course, because of COVID, we've, uh, we've experienced a setback, but uh, we had a wonderful food summit in collaboration with, um, with the Food Network uh, last year, as well as uh, a wonderful indigenous elder uh, from the city of Toronto who used to work for Food Chair. And we've sort of, you know, uh, created some, um, you know, some movement in, in terms of the system, the institution in, um, in sort of saying, yes, we're going to have a community garden. So let's see how that goes. I'll keep you posted. Maybe you'll have, have me back again for a food story next year once we have the garden going. Well, you know what? That all sounds really exciting because it, it really shows how you took what you learned in your foundation and now you've tra that's translated into what you're currently doing now um yeah. and i like how you've connected sort of that need for good food and uh, that need to be even just like participating in getting your food in your work um yeah. in the like as a social service worker that, that those wow. It really shows how food is integral in almost like every single capacity. Yeah, and I mean, I, I you know, I, as you know, Maxine, I actually spent two decades of my life working in community. So I worked in, in the HIV AIDS sector here in your region, and then I worked uh, within the homelessness sector here in your region. So in both those in both those spaces, as a leader within those organizations. I saw firsthand the struggles of people who are really vulnerable, um, mm. you know, and especially when they're immunocompromised, if they're living with HIV or Hep C related issues or any kind, you know, any other issues, whether it's relating to substance use or poor mental health, food is a really important healer, you know? And so when people really struggled with not having food, we were constantly talking about it, whether it was through the Alliance Against Homelessness or through the Violence Against Women Coordinating uh, Committee or through the Harm Reduction Table. Um, you know, we were really talking about how do we um, actually enable, uh, you know, food systems that are accessible for really vulnerable uh, populations, you know? I mean, there's so much food waste. And I mean, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, we were constantly collaborating, you know, yeah. with uh, food banks, with uh, churches, with um, York Region Food Network, you know, trying to make sure, uh, and farmers, right? Like we were trying to get food boxes to our community, trying to kind of access uh, very reasonably priced food so that families could actually cook at home, you know, because mm -hmm. we saw very diverse populations. We had clients who came from everywhere, you know, we had newcomer families from all over the place who could teach us a lot about food, right? Like most of the traditional cultures and cultures from diverse diasporas, they have a lot of wonderful, rich traditions that they're yeah. bringing into Canada. And so we have a lot to learn. And so, you know, instead of, and we know, right, the healthy migrant effect that says that people who come in here with good health, actually start to lose their you know uh, you know their wellness the longer they remain in canada and become their health becomes the same as a canadian born person so i mean we know these things research tells us all these things and so you know why not support um you know people's wellness from the get-go and, yeah. and i think that's a really important part um and you know i personally feel um uh really um, responsible, you know, and, and, and I have a lot of privilege in my life, you know, I have a job, I have a home, I have a car, you know, I have a Canadian passport, you know, all these things are very, very big privileges. And I, I need to be able to use them with care um, yes. and, 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 and enable, you know, resources for people in my community. Because that, again, going back to Mandela's idea of Ubuntu, is is an or harambe or ujama those things are very much tied to my worldview and yeah. so i carry it with me wherever i go you know yeah so 
Wow. So, <laughs> you, so your hands have been in so many different sections. Um, and I really want to like explore that a little bit more. So can you tell us though, so how, because we were in your childhood and you were living in East Africa and your experiences there. Um, and then you're, so can you help us bridge that gap between um, sort of working in these community services and like leaving um, Africa? So can you bridge that oh, yeah. gap and help us understand like what happened in between here and here to lead, to lead you to the, all these different experiences that you've had so far in Canada? Yeah, uh, no, for sure. I mean, I actually, last night I was uh, sort of lying in bed trying to remember uh, sort of very early food experiences. And, you know, like food's very sensual, right? Like food is very, very sensual. And so one of my earliest memories, uh, as I was digging back, you know, how you kind of think about your memories and, you know, they, they're very, um, they bring back a lot, right? Smells and tastes and things like that. So I was just really thinking back to some of my earliest memories. And one of them that came up in my mind was this, this uh, trip to Zanzibar with my, with my dad and mom, my brother, and walking mm -hmm. with my hands, you know, in my dad's hands, you know, and walking through these ancient, you know, um, cobblestone pathways in Zanzibar, and seeing this elderly gentleman, you know, uh, making halwa, which is a dessert, in, in this giant cauldron, you know, right on the street. And, you know, it was filled with ghee and butter and all the spices from the island because Zanzibar is a spice island. So, you know, there was cinnamon and cardamom and all these things poured in. And he was singing this lovely, um, you know, Swahili song. And we sat there watching him make this. and. And we all sat down and we ate this halwa together on the street. And I mean, that memory brings together so much, you know, it brings, I mean, my dad's no more. Um, but, you know, like those, those memories of food to me are very sensual memories or, yeah. you know, sitting in my grandmother's kitchen, uh, watching all my aunts, my mother sort of cooking food. Um, mm -hmm. for the family, you know, talking to each other about what had happened during the day or you know uh, you know what was going on in their lives you know or even like growing up in East Africa you know seeing um, you know my other moms like my other mothers who helped to raise me you know making mandazis and bitumbua and all these wonderful um, you know uh, foods uh, you know really kind of you know, enhanced with flavors of that place, you know, it's very sensual for me, right? Like for me, food is, is so many things, right? Mm -hmm. So when I moved to Canada, I moved to Canada, um, you know, primarily to pursue education, um, to, um, you know, to, you know, my family moved here for job related, you know, um, employment related um, issues. So I moved here very much, you know, uh, you know, feeling a lot of grief and loss, right? Like as other migrants would, you know, when yeah. you leave a place that is sunny all the time and, you know, you have papaya trees in your backyard. And I remember walking and plucking a passion fruit uh, from the vine outside my window and sitting and eating it in the sun, you know? I mean, these are some of the very sensual experiences around food. And then we moved here and you're so socially isolated because you are the other, you know, all of a sudden you've gone from this very community experience to coming to a place where you really um, have to relearn everything, which is right. exciting at one, on the one hand, it's very exciting. And on the other hand, it's also very much, um, it's also very um, trauma inducing, you know, like, especially when. I mean, for me, it was different, but when little people come, like little children come, whether they're refugees or newcomers, that can be really challenging, depending on what they've left behind and what they've seen. So for me, I came here, um, and fortunately, I had my brother here, and, um, and so, you know, you try to cobble together, you know, mm -hmm. you know, a life here, and of course, food is a big part of that, right? So we would go to Gerard Street and pick up things or we'd go to St. Lawrence Market, you know, and Kensington Market and 
because the market experience, again, was very much a part of our lives, right? So uh, growing up, I would go with my brother to Mangueta, and it was this colorful, colorful place where, you know, um, women and men sold all kinds of things. Like, you know, you could buy chicken, you could buy like, you know, you could buy, you know, uh, ginger, you could buy like mangoes, you know, guavas, you know, whatever. But it was just a very bustling environment. So for us, we sought out those hustle bustle places. So we found it like a ritual to go to these markets and, and pick up what we needed. And of course, you know, some of that is lost in translation, right? When you get food here from other places, when they're imported, they don't have the same flavors and the tastes and so on. Uh, so we had to really reinvent our, our game, you know, over here. Um, my brother is an amazing cook. And so we really had to kind of figure out how to, um, how to live. And of course, the winters uh, were very hard for us. Um, yeah. and of course, you know, not having community was extremely hard for us. And we were living, yeah. um, just in a very low income kind of a situation. So struggling mm -hmm. through poverty and, you know, having to pay school fees, going to school, paying for rent. I mean, it was very, very difficult. I mean, uh, I can't, I can't glorify, um, you know, poverty in any way, you know, it's a very difficult thing. And of course we also had you know, uh, experience with being other, you know, so we had we experienced racism in, you know, in the housing market and in, in the employment market. Um, right. But all those things we had to integrate into our lives, right? And we had to figure out uh, how to negotiate a new country. And we, right. we have had, you know, uh, you know, uh, wonderful experiences here as well. Like, you know, we found the, the communities we need, you know, for me, the not-for-profit sector is my community, you know, the people yeah. I've worked with, the people I've served, they're my family. I mean, last weekend, we had a gathering here, and in that gathering, you know, we had uh, conversations with, uh, you know, uh, folks from all over, you know, and people who had worked with me, people who, uh, you know, I had supported, we had these very amazing conversations and uh, around food, and you know, HIV stigma was so high, you know, here uh, when I moved here. Um, so, you know, we, we really did, um, um, you know, try really hard as newcomers to find those communities that we could relate to, right? Mm -hmm, that we mm -hmm. could be a part of. And because we grew up in a very diverse, rich, uh, you know, uh, environment, we really sought those out for ourselves here, you know. Um, so I went to school here. So I, you know, uh, did um, I completed an undergrad at York University. I was a young mom, so I had a little kid. So I had my little daughter that I took with me to my classes, and then I did my MSW at University of Toronto. So I um, did that later on, and I was working for a, a newcomer. Um, um, you know, agency, like an immigrant community service in, in Bradford and in Simcoe County. And so okay. I, I, you know, was again around a lot of immigrants and seeing their concerns around food and, you know, housing and all these things, uh, you know, in my 20s. And again, so I was pulled into that work. And then I also, um, you know, um, got connected to HIV uh, and AIDS work because I lost someone very dear. Uh, in my life in high school to, um, to HIV and AIDS. And, uh, you know, we're talking about the 80s and 90s where it was a really um, devastating uh, pandemic, yeah. and, you know, yeah. global concern. And particularly in on the continent of Africa, um, you know, yeah. the devastation was immense. And so, um, you know, and so working in that field in York region, um, allowed me once again to uh, to connect with people um, um, you know from different parts of the world um, who are living here and um, you know struggling with access related issues and healthcare access and um, all kinds of social determinants of health you know and um, and so um, yeah and then I, I uh, continue to uh, live and work here 
uh, and play here, uh, was involved at, in a lot of tables. And as I said, you know, the Violence Against Women Coordinating Committee, the, um, right now I'm on the Food Council. I also um, was uh, working at the at, at Blue Door Shelters as uh, the ED there. And so once again, you know, seeing the struggles of men and families and youth, you know, um, uh, it was it was it was complicated uh, and layered, you know, as uh, systems are. Uh, but food, the thread of you know food and hunger, sort of runs through all those narratives, right? Um, I remember walking into um, uh, you know one of our clients' homes, you know, um, and she was you know telling me she didn't have enough milk to feed her little guy, you know, and so she was watering it down with you know, to, to make sure it lasted, you know, longer. Um, and young people, you know, at the shelter who may be using substances and really struggling with poor mental health, you know, food is a really important part of their healing. You know, if they didn't get, get adequate food or enough food, you know, and not fillers, you know, not like white bread, and, you know, and, and carbs, but really like vegetables and things and, and, and that they could eat. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things I always say is, you know, why should our, our, our vulnerable communities eat badly? You know, if anything, we should feed our vulnerable communities the best of food, you know, yes. because we want people to live really well and not have to use our healthcare system. You know, we want people to really um, uh, rejoice in, in food and health, right? But how can we do that if we actually are giving people um, you know, five bucks a day for, for food, you know, like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like, how is that possible, really? And why would, a, why would a child be happy and delighted with that? And why should we say that that's okay, Do you know? Like, this kind of issue around equity is really important to understand because oftentimes it's usually Black and Indigenous and racialized communities and people living with disabilities, people who are in sex work, people who are really struggling with substance-related issues around mental health, they're the ones living in hunger. And it's not okay, right? It's not okay because, you know, we really need to think through uh, our priorities as communities. You know, we really need to think through what are we doing with these lands and how can we, you know, how can we challenge our systems, the corporations, you know, mm -hmm. to, to to do better because this is not acceptable. And we're seeing that now during COVID-19, we're mm -hmm. seeing who's most impacted and who's falling sick, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a very complex intersectional narrative, right, Maxine? It's not one thing, right? It's a bunch of things working yeah. together. You know, it, it, you're absolutely right on that. And it's like food does impact all of these other areas like so profoundly. And, uh, you know, you made the point that why is it that we would feed our most vulnerable communities the worst food? Um, yeah. You know, it's just like, it's definitely a, a, an imbalance. And COVID has definitely shown a light on that. Mm -hmm. even more so, um, mm -hmm. as more and more communities, just based on the situation, fell into, yeah. that, into that parameter, into those being, becoming the more vulnerable. Um, because of the situation. Yeah, and, and as a society, we need to talk about how food is grown in our communities. Like, who grows our food? You know, how is food created? You know, food is created. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a Canadian born person who's growing our food. If you go to the marsh, which is exactly a few kilometers north of here, Holland Marsh, you're going to see racialized people like Caribbean men and Mexican men and you know, um, Asian, you know, uh, communities who are cooking, I mean, who are raising crops, right? Um, they're all, you know, migrant farm workers, you know, mm -hmm. and how are we supporting their health? You know, we've seen COVID-19 really escalate within those communities because social isolation is not possible, right? Yeah. In, if you're living 15 men to one small um, you know, house, you know, a house or a portable, you know? Yeah. So we really need to understand this idea of social justice. You know, it's, it is a very complex, around food is very complex. You know, we have to look at, 
the hand of corporations, the hand of our governments, right? Like our mm. government is absolutely involved in, in um, uh, creating this uh, um, migrant farm work, um, you, know, um, you know, solution for, um, for our farmers. And we have to look at food in so many different ways and we have to challenge each other and really join the movements that are already existing um, yeah. because they're there, right? Like you guys, you're creating amazing movements. I know that because I'm part of your, you know, uh, the, the, the food, um, you know, tables. I'm mm -hmm. also thinking about, you know, groups like Justicia for Migrant Workers and other groups that are actually bringing the, the plight of people who are growing our food to light, you know, and mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. you know, this, the health, the health situation for these workers needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed systemically, right? Like we yeah. have a lot of food banks and I talk about this with my students when we talk about issues relating to food security. Food banks serve a purpose, no okay. question, you know, but they're not the solution for our food issues, right? Okay. We, mm -hmm. can't, we can't solve our food issues through charity. You know, this is not how it works. Uh, can you help? Um, like I'm, I'm very, sorry, I'm very familiar with uh, sort of what what you're talking about, but maybe everyone listening isn't. So you, can you help us understand? Because definitely, when we see when you, all the things that you're bringing up about um, like issues around food, uh, you know, oftentimes our go-to is looking towards our food banks as our our our, our solution. And so you bring up the point that um, it it has a purpose but it's not the solution. Can you help um, unpack that a little bit so we can understand a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, I mean, food, food banks historically in Canada, you know, the idea of, of food charity is mm -hmm. uh, very embedded in our culture historically in Canada. You know, we, we have, you know, we, we had churches and other community members, social workers, you know, um, people who really kind of tried to solve um, you know, the, the issue of food poverty through, through charity, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what has happened over the years in, in our country is that, you know, our governments have abrogated their responsibility towards, towards, towards that issue. And, you know, until, you know, a few years ago, we weren't even gathering data and evidence around food insecurity, you know? Okay. So there were a lot of gaps in our knowledge as a society. Um, we really didn't. Um, we, we we really didn't take care of business, really. And to be honest, I think you know, um, uh, you know, a systems lens is essential because you know, food insecurity t is tied to poverty. You know, it's tied to our minimum wage. It's tied to mm -hmm. you know employment. It's tied to other social determinants of health. It's mm -hmm. not sort of living on its own over here. And then we're working on employment and all these other things. So we really need strong food policies in our society because, you know, there are not enough uh, canned beans in this world to feed our hunger, you know? And there's so many yeah. people who don't access food banks because of the shame and stigma associated with asking for food, you yeah, know? Yeah. And okay. going into a food bank, and actually saying, oh, I'd like to take this. I mean, that, that can be hugely shaming to, to people, you know? Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and also some of the food may not be appropriate for certain communities, right? Who are maybe not accustomed to eating the, the, the kind of types of food that are available uh, in food banks. And I think a lot has been done to address that, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the last 20 years that I've been in this work, you know, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, shifts and changes within those practices so that you know you may find a can of aki you know in, you know which you wouldn't find before but still i don't think we can you know it is established that we cannot resolve the problem of food insecurity through through food banks you know okay. much as i love having that option for people we yeah. really cannot solve it through charity this is a institutional it is a systemic, uh, you know, issue that requires policy and thought. It requires addressing, you know, social determinants of health. It requires mm -hmm. investment, financial investment 
It requires mm -hmm. looking at our taxation system, how we're taxing people. Mm -hmm. and, and these are not things that they're all proven, right? Research has shown that we need to look at our tax system. We need to look at, you know, minimum wage. We need to look at basic income guarantees for our communities. Right. We need to do a lot of comprehensive things to address the issue of food in our society, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. Radhi, you're getting some thumbs up <laughs> for, for what you're, the information you're sharing, yes. Thank you. I also, also want to say, of course, you know, that I, you know, I don't want to take away from, you know, from the power and the role of food banks in our communities, right? Like, this is not the point is to, oh, let's shut down the banks and move on, you know, because there is a space for them. And they are, you know, providing access in communities where that's not available. But if you think about Indigenous communities in remote parts of Canada, the mm -hmm. cost of food there is abysmal, you know? You can't yeah. go, you, you went into a, the only sort of convenience slash grocery stores in some of these, in some of these communities, you're not going to find food, you know, that, that in fact, you know, some of the food is expired, you know, and okay. how can you say that in a country like Canada, you know, which is supposed to be, you know, so progressive and advanced. And we talk about all these things constantly till we're blue in our face, but yet yeah. there's an indigenous child a few hours from here that can't, who can't even access clean water. You know, That's so there's right. things we need to really talk about, you know, right here in Georgina Island, water is an issue, you know, yes, That's yes. not too far from us, you know, the, the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation are exactly an hour away from us, you know, and mm -hmm. so we really need to think through at a systemic level, how are we taking care of our communities and our governments, we need to advocate for change at municipal, provincial, federal level and start kind of, you know, writing to our MPs, showing up at events, you know, asking mm -hmm. for change and, and really asking those profound questions, not just during election time, because some of us, you know, we go and we vote and we think, okay, that's my good deed, you know, and, and, and that's not, that's, it's a good start, you know, but we need to do a lot more throughout yeah. the years, you know, we need to really stand in solidarities and become co-conspirators rather just rather than just sort of you know um, you know speechifying about it, right? Like yeah. we actually need to go to the farmers markets and talk to our farmers every weekend and see what they're doing. You know, we need to buy local produce. You know, we need to start allowing access to those things to communities who are living in low-income housing. You know, how can That's we right. build community gardens there? We mm -hmm. have a lot of work to do, Maxine. You've yeah. just started a little. You've started me on a on a little rant, so I'll pull back <laughs> and let you take the lead. Well, your passion is very evident, Rada. Like definitely and and i can see how it's all sort of been tying together to like where you're at now um and you're right you know what there's so much work that needs to be done but it, it has to start with us starting to look at things through the proper lens um mm -hmm. instead of throwing band-aids on 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 everything um yes yeah it's a lot it's a lot more work that needs to happen below the surface yeah, and I mean, and, and a lot of that education and awareness raising also needs to happen in our homes, you know, like, as I said, we're so far from food, but you know, like, when we want, buy bananas, you know, which have the black spots on it, you know, um, you know, these are things that people kind of go, well, you know, the, in the marketplace, we look for that perfect banana that has no blemishes. Well, we need to start educating our communities that it takes a lot of resources to create a blemish-free banana. In fact, that's a freak banana. You know what I mean? Like bananas are supposed to have blemishes. In fact, we used to look for plantains, and you would know this, Maxine, just from your own cultural context, is we would look for plantains that had, you know, that were soft, that had, a, you know, that were darker, so that when we fried them, the flavor would be amazing. The sun would have sat with it for a lot longer, right? Yeah, so we yeah. need to start telling people, you can't wander around eating, you know, strawberries in winter time in February and that there isn't a consequence for that, right? There are consequences to all these things. So it's really thinking about 
Like I think we've gone too far the other way with our greed that we are availing ourselves to all kinds of things all the time. You know, yeah. we, we don't stop to think about how these things are made and, and the work that goes into these things. You know, I, when I grew up, you know, growing up as a child, we only ate what was in season. Absolutely. There was yeah. a season for papaya. There was a season for mangoes. There was a season for guavas. You know, we weren't accessing things anytime we clicked our finger. Oh, there it is. We have strawberries today. That yeah. was not our story, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about a lot of, um, you know, indigenous understandings here in Canada, the same is true, you know? Like right. people lived with the season in harmony with nature, you know? Mm -hmm. We weren't, you know, we weren't taxing our, our lands and eating in, in ways that were not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. And the same is true of people who came here from different parts of the world, whether you know, that was Europe or anywhere else. I mean, people grew up living, you know, with the season, right? And um, so I think we need to start kind of educating our communities around effort it takes to farm and the kind of work it takes to, to sort of produce things, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. also start connecting diverse communities um, back to the land, right? Because if you think about you know, the history of slavery and, and, and farming in, in North America and, you know, in, in, on the islands and everywhere else, you know, our farms were practically, you know, um, you know, raised by, by racialized people, black people, indigenous people, people of color. But yeah. yet those communities today are so far from farming, right? Because they don't have the land and they don't know they're, so far away and we see these communities really struggling with health related issues like obesity you know a lot of sugar laden food that they're eating because yeah. because they don't have access to the foods that are traditional to their culture right you know and so i was yeah. just gonna say that that was that's such a um like an interesting perspective because you're absolutely right a lot of um sort of the agriculture uh techniques and learning came from uh african or people from the diaspora african and caribbean folks because they had such um strong farming history and understanding and knowledge um and it's absolutely what you just said where the only thing was like that knowledge had been passed on uh which created a lot of the communities that exist throughout North America and obviously throughout the Caribbean. And, um, but the, the issue was not the ability or the skill to grow food, but the lack of the access to the land that was needed. Yes. So we weren't allowed to own land to, and yes. then care for ourselves and, um, you know, and, and build, because like you just explained in the beginning of our talk, food sovereignty was like a core foundational way in which people on the continent survived. Uh, yeah. It was like growing your own, harvesting your own, sharing that food. So that understanding was like there within people from, uh, f within the slaves and, and people from the continent. And so, wow, that's a really powerful point that you just made is the access piece again, which is, and now, as a result of that, those communities are the ones, the indigenous communities who hands down were the ones who taught everyone like how to use the land, how to travel, how to trade. Um, yeah. You know, they put that education forth and then now they're struggling, like you said, in remote areas, uh, having to access food that has nothing to do with culture, community or anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and, and you know, and you know, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, I um, was with a colleague of mine uh, in Simcoe County who was working with um, Bannock, which is a Bay Area Native Advisory um, uh, Committee. Um, you know, we actually traveled to uh, last summer to several, uh, you know, reserves in, in Simcoe County, you know, we went and spoke to elders about Alzheimer's and dementia and sort of we're gathering stories, you know, and, and sort of trying to get their understanding of, um, of the associations, you know, relating to, you know, dementia and what triggers it and, 
and health re- food was you know one of the things we talked about and you know sitting with these elders you know on Bosole island and you know some of these wata and some of these really remote communities you know and listening to the elders really speak about the fact that you know they're the store like the one store on these uh on these you know on these reserves or whatever um have hardly any fresh produce right okay. and and so how do we you know how can we rationally reasonably sit there in these communities as health providers and health care health promoters right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and talk about alzheimer's and diabetes and all these things when we as settlers have stolen so much from these communities right we've stolen land and resources and practices and now we're going there to teach them how to how to eat i mean it is a hugely problematic situation you know and and for me i'm constantly aware of my my location as a settler in canada mm-hmm. and my responsibility you know to to talk about this wherever i go and 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 to do whatever i can in in small ways to um to bring this uh you know conversation up wherever I'm asked to share a few words because I think we all need to know you know the heavy price paid by indigenous communities here in Canada because yeah. of settling here you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um and we need to know that we you know when we talk about health and we talk about re- issues relating to health we really have to keep cultural context and the impact of colonization very much in the forefront of those discourses right um yeah. and we need to kind of begin there and acknowledge and take responsibility and own that and then move into listening and and and, and learning from and working together mm-hmm. to now cobble solutions right um so that was a very important um you know understanding for me like going to some of these communities and sitting with elders and laughing and talking over food right but yeah. a lot of the food was sugary food you know and there we are talking about diabetes and people are eating donuts you know and i'm just like wow you know we we are we have harmed so much you know and we need to we need to really uh challenge our our systems our governments mm-hmm. and um uh, you know building accountability to all programs that we offer you know whether yeah. it's a food network or whether it's me teaching at Seneca these need to be conversations where encouraging and having and trying to co-create solutions together yeah no absolutely and so i can see how your work in uh, um at Seneca will definitely lend into this because the more knowledge and understanding that people gain then the more ability we have to be doing the right things to help and to make that change So yeah. And, and, yeah and and part of my work is also through Banyan Tree Circles and okay. Banyan Tree Circles allows me to do uh work in um uh, you know in community based organizations with grassroots groups whether it's here or you know in other parts of the world and that is precisely the reason the name is Banyan Tree Circles is to to sort of create circles of care you know and not you know just replicate and 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 contextualize ideas and share things across circles you know and mm. so i really believe um you know uh communities talking to communities is really where the answer lies you know if we're going to wait around for systems to make change we'll be waiting for a long time you know mm-hmm. so i think communities talking to communities advocating at the same time but really trying to create local solutions for local issues is really the way to go i mean that's just my uh deep belief and understanding from what i know um and what mm-hmm. i've seen to work right yeah. lived experience lived experience is what drives change right Absolutely, so people yeah. coming in with these expert ideas and display you know placing them over us those don't tend to work you know we need to actually you know um take ownership and create solutions as people who live in these spaces so um right. very important um so uh just uh so are we going for time maxine 
Do we have uh, more time? We, we do have more time and and I just wanted you to talk just um, I know you made some deliciousness that you were going to share with us. But before we get to that, can you um, so just can you explain just a little bit more about what Banyan Tree Circle is and um, and sort of like what you do specifically there? OK, so um, so I um, worked in uh, community-based organizations for, um, you know, many, many years. And, um, you know, when I switched over to academia, so when I started teaching uh, at Seneca College in a more sort of permanent capacity, I really missed being in community. You know, uh, um, you know, I loved my advocacy work. I loved, you know, connecting, you know, um, you know, uh, resources to each other. I uh, love engaging in conversations about change making. I love causing good trouble, right? Like I love good trouble. So, um, so therefore I, uh, you know, talked to uh, a few of my colleagues and um, people that I really uh, love and appreciate and who are sort of change makers in their own right, whether it's, you know, relating to um, the legal sector or whether it's relating to uh, community-based sector within education or whatever, you know, and we um, decided to uh, collaborate on uh, projects that were, um, you know, dear to us, you know, in, in um, you know, in York and in Simcoe County, really. And um, because this is where I, I live, and so I want to be part of change-making conversations here in this community, and I've also lived in Simcoe County, so I really am very much interested in what happens north of Finch, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I think the city of Toronto has a lot of resources, a lot of great work happening. And yeah. we do too, but we need to grow those, those um, capacities, right, within our own neighborhoods. So I'm really interested in that. And so through uh, forming Banyan Tree Circles, which is like a consulting, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, firm, but also does a lot of community-based work, some pro bono stuff. We've actually managed to do some very interesting projects together, whether it is helping organizations develop policies, whether it is doing education and training, whether it is just showing up and being part of conversations that are important. Um, you know, so, and also I do some international development work, so I do some work with an organization that I love, which is then um, HIV AIDS, um, you know, care home for uh, young, um, you know, children and youth in, in New Delhi. So I do some work with them. And so, you know, trying to sort of use, you know, whatever skill sets I have um, to sort of support um, um, organizations that are sometimes really strapped. For, um, for resources, right? So mm -hmm. that's really what Banyan Tree Circles, and it, it came up, you know, also because wellness is really important to me. Uh, the idea of, of wellness within um, ourselves as individuals, but also wellness in our families, in, in our, in our uh, institutions, in our broader mm -hmm. community, um, you know, everything's so intersectional that, for me, I, I'm really interested in those conversations. And, you know, I think um, wellness itself, you know, um, within our, uh, within um, community-based organizations is sometimes challenged because of the amount of work and the level of uh, commitment we have, right? Um, so sometimes we forget to take care of the people who are doing the work, right? We forget to right. take care of, uh, of the humanity that exists in this work, right? We don't hold it and nurture it in the ways we need to because we're constantly putting out fires, right? We're constantly uh, being asked to innovate and be, you know, be changed, you know, changing things and um, yeah. constantly meeting new challenges. Like look at what, you know, we've had to do just for COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm, Our DNA absolutely. has had to shift to accommodate this. And so, yeah. You know, a lot of these times, wellness sort of goes to the wayside, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm really interested in supporting um, organizations develop, um, um, you know, policies and understandings and 
um, you know, two commitments and accountabilities relating to wellness. And okay. so I've been doing uh, work around that as well. Wow. Yeah. So you have a full plate. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it, it's a good, it's a good full plate, you know, and I want to say very much, you know, this, this conversation with you stems from my understanding of my own privileges, right? Like really, um, this is what we, I should be doing. You know, this, this is, this is what I should be doing because, uh, I have been given, uh, opportunities, you know, yeah. and I want to make sure those opportunities translate to change. You know, I don't want, um, uh, I don't want to let these things slip by, you know, to me, it doesn't feel warrant, you know, it doesn't feel like something extra or, right. you know, that there's, you know, this just feels right. You know, this is what I'm supposed to do as a human being in, in this place, in this time. And mm -hmm. uh, I need to be able to use what I have to share what I have. Mm -hmm. And again, the idea of, you know, I am very much connected and interconnected with everything around me, right? So if that is unhealthy, then I'm going to be unhealthy. So that understanding is very much embedded. So um, we all need to sort of, learn and use our privileges in ways that we can. Not everybody is in a place where they can do this. I am, and therefore I'm, I'm doing this, but we really need to have deeper, meaningful conversations about this. Yeah, and I appreciate a lot how you just talk about, so you're talking about supporting the communities that support the communities. Um, yeah. So, you know, like that, that's, a, that's a piece that's important as well, because you're right, as doing this kind of work, you can e easily get like, you can be the one who gets overwhelmed and and um and everything like through all, all the all the work that needs to get done so even yeah. offering this support like that's that's a great um option and so we just popped up your um if anyone is interested in connecting with uh, rada um um in regards to banyan tree circle we just popped up your website there so uh, oh, people cool. can have access to you um and yeah. that'll be mm -hmm. so yeah they can they can read all about me and all about uh, some of the things we're doing over there. Yeah, yeah so lots more detail. It, it's great work and uh, I'm just grateful for you for, for doing that work. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Maxine. And, and I want to say that, you know, um, especially now, given this uh, pandemic and given what we're hearing and the stresses on community-based organizations, you know, we are seeing a lot of um, workers within those uh, within those organizations really struggle with their own mental health, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, vicarious trauma and just general um, struggles with with health and uh, you know and our mental health is is a very important thing to pay attention to um, mm -hmm. and to really kind of start putting dollars and cents around it in our budgets, right? Because it's, uh, it's um, not nothing, you know? We, we need to be well. If we're not well, we're not gonna be taking care of anything really. So yeah. I think uh, that is really important. And, and not just, you know, we hear these conversations. I mean, I recently heard uh, someone say that they were giving their staff a half a day off, um, you know, uh, you know or, or something, um, you know, in order to sort of sustain people's health or some other organization talking about, um, you know, bringing in um, some supports for one day, right? Like where they had, you know, a day where they, um, a restorative day, you know, where they spent one day sort of eating good food and so on and trying to replenish um, their spirits. And while these are all, you know, important gestures, um, Meaningful, meaningful change comes from really looking at how are we embedding this into our daily practice, right? Um, how are we embedding this in the value system, in the strategic plans of our organizations? And how are we moving this forward, like not just once a year or three times a year or four times a year, but how are we doing this on an ongoing basis rather than just, you know, um, putting a little... Um, you know, check mark on that saying, yeah, I took care of that. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. we need to really think it through more as a society because mm -hmm. there's so much that prevents us from thinking about health, right? 
There's so much yeah. that prevents us from thinking about wellness. And we are trying to teach those skills to the people who come to us for support. Well, how yeah. can we do that if we are actually not doing any of that ourselves? You know, so, um, yeah, so we need to have bigger, broader conversations. Yes. No, those are really great points. And I did thank you for um, bringing them up because anyone, uh, as you listen to, to this uh, food story, that's something that we can all kind of sit with and reflect on and, and look for solutions. Um, so we just have, we have a little bit of time left, but I know you did make some, some things and I would love for you to share with us what you made today. Because yeah. um, like yeah, everything, it's come around food, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to, so I want to share that, um, you know, the recipe I shared with you is uh, called the kitchen. Okay, it's, it's a traditional um, uh, recipe from India. And okay. almost every part of India has its own kitchen recipe. Okay, it's like this. Um, it's, it's, it's something you eat to restore your, your, your spirit. It's very simple. Um, you know, you use whatever is in the kitchen, really. It, it doesn't require a lot of pre-planning, which is why it, it is such a commonly, uh, you know, used recipe. And it also looks different depending on which part of India you're in. So, and almost every family has their little variation of the kitchen recipe, right? So it's basically, uh, I'm going to walk us over to this place. So if you uh, bear with me. I'm just going to lift this and I'm going to move it over here um, so you can see. Can you see that? Can you see the, the stove there? I can see the stove, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, you know, so um, I made a couple of things. Okay, the first thing is the kitchen recipe. So it's mm -hmm. still warm. It's really hot. So I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to bring it over to the camera so you can actually see it. So it looks like it looks like this. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see that? Can, can you come a little closer? We can kind of see it. If you come closer, then we can. Okay, now we can get a good look. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually like a a pot of rice and lentils put together with all kinds of vegetables in um. In the pot. So this particular kitchen has things like squash, it has uh, potatoes and carrots, and um, it also has, um, uh, you know, uh, lentils, which are, you know, these kinds of lentils. So this particular lentil, and you know, it's this small yellow lentil, but you can pretty much make it with any lentil. Mm -hmm. and also uh, a little bit of rice okay so you kind of as i said cook what's in your fridge you know and you yeah. also throw in tomatoes and ginger because it's supposed to warm you up okay? it's supposed to uh create warmth and it's supposed to nourish you it's a one pot meal so when my daughter was going off to university uh one of the first things i taught her was this okay i taught her how to make kitchen because you know, who has the time to kind of cook all the time, right? Like, so mm -hmm. if you cook something in one pot, you're done, right? You're done, yeah. So, um, <laughs> and it has a lot of nutrients. So it's very easy. It's accessible. So all the ingredients would be very cheap, right? Yeah. So that's another reason why I wanted to share this recipe is anyone who is low income or struggling with finance can actually do this, okay? Because yeah. it's not, not going to cost a lot to make a pot of kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to share with you is um, uh, something that is from uh, Kenya and Tanzania and is called um, Sukuma Wiki. Okay, so Sukuma Wiki is, I'm going to show you here. I hope, can you see that? I can't turn it too much. No, I can see it now. Yeah. Oh, that looks delicious. That looks yeah. Delicious. So this is made traditionally with. Um, onions and tomatoes and mm -hmm. uh, collard greens and um, lemon um, mm -hmm. and, um, and a little bit of paprika, you know, yeah. and salt, of course. And so 
you know, a lot of these things came in there, came from my garden. So for example, the, the kale came from my garden. Some of the coriander is grown in the garden. Yeah. I have this uh, green pepper that I, you know, I have like a, you know, a container gardens in the back and some onions and there's a little bit of garlic in here too. And yeah. so all of these things, um, you chop and you throw into this. It, it took me exactly, and here's some tomatoes, like you can put in some tomatoes in there. The whole, these are the ingredients that go into this and the whole thing took about 15 minutes to make, right? So, and it's cheap, right? And it's cheap and you can grow kale. I grow kale in my backyard. I don't, I didn't have collard greens, so I replaced it with kale. Yeah. So traditionally, traditionally you could use collard greens or kale. Now, yeah. I grew up eating this in my home. All my aunties, so all my black and brown aunties in South Africa made sukumawiki, okay, which is a traditional dish. And I remember once um, going on safari to a traditional Sambulu village, right? We went, uh, we went with a friend who was from that village and we sat in a, in a hut, in a, in a little hut in the middle of um, the Samburu in, in Kenya. And this very traditional woman, um, and I was this tiny, you know, at that time, <laughs> it sat on a low stool and she had a little, you know, fire um, just outside her hut. And she made this wonderful sukumawiki and ugali, which is like, ugali is like a cornmeal uh, mm -hmm. dish. And so you kind of eat the cornmeal with the, with the greens, right? Yes. And she didn't have a lot, but she made this for her children and for me and for my brother because we were her visitors. Yes. And I can tell you, it was one of the best meals that I, I've ever eaten. And if all the ingredients came from her patch, like she had a little garden, yeah. she knew everything. And mm -hmm. we sat there and we didn't speak the language, right? Like I couldn't speak the language of her tribe. I spoke Swahili, I speak Swahili, but I couldn't speak that language. So we talked with gestures. The yeah. same, I had a very similar experience when I went to Bhutan a few years ago, which is a small Himalayan kingdom north of India. And, um, you know, going into a little, um, little farm outside of Paro, which is the capital, and sitting with, you know, the guide and his auntie, and we were drinking butter tea and greens from her garden, right? So she had grown all this and she was an elderly lady and we had no language with which to speak, like, you know, in terms of, you know, yeah. she was a Bhutanese woman. Mm -hmm. And yet we had this wonderful two hours of pleasantness, you know, <laughs> talking with gestures and her showing me her garden and, you know, uh, sitting down and having butter tea in her, in her, in her little, little home. And I can tell you that food is medicine and food is community, right? Like no matter where you go, they yeah. will find, you will find these things. So the reason I chose these dishes are because they're very easy and quick to make and very reasonable yeah. and, afford and affordable. So if yeah. people are watching, are watching this, I want to invite them, you know, to try simple things, right? Food, it's very forgiving, right? Cooking, it's a very forgiving thing. Right? You can it cook, is. Try. You know, I didn't cook until I was well into my 20s, you know? Mm -hmm. I never cooked. I mean, I don't know what I ate, but, you know, I ate <laughs> with, with people. My brother was a really good cook. In fact, the chili, this particular chili that you see here, you know, yeah. um, you know, came from my brother giving me a chili plant because mm -hmm. he has a garden in his backyard and I have uh, a garden here. So he gave me this chili plant to grow in my garden, you know? So, mm -hmm. also like things like, you know, um, nasturtiums, right? And mm -hmm. coriander. I mean, you can grow this in a pot, right? You just throw some seeds in, but you can eat this. Like you can actually pluck this flower. Yeah, you can pluck this flower and eat it. Yeah. And I, I love flowers. They're delicious. <laughs> They're delicious. And you can, you can grow so many things, you know, in your, in your, um, in your, in your little container, um, you know, garden. That yeah. You can make some things available to your family. 
and connect them back, you know, to, to land. Absolutely. So that's what I wanted to show you. Yeah. Well, so thank you so much. I wish we were there that we could taste it because <laughs> it sounds you know delicious. What? You know what? It, it looks really good. I haven't tasted it myself, but I'm going to have it for lunch with my, with my lovely child sitting upstairs, Chris. We're going to sit outside in the sun and we're going to eat some food together. And yeah. so, you know, I really appreciate that, you know, I had this chance to, to share some of my home recipes with you. So the Sukuma Wiki, I didn't share that recipe with you, but I will. Mm -hmm. But I think you have the kitchen. So the kitchen comes from my uh, Indian heritage from India. And the Sukuma Wiki comes from my East African, um, you know, experiences, right? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so and it's so wonderful to... how the two things, like I'm sure they marry beautifully together. Because um, in, yeah. in Caribbean culture, we have similar dishes. So yeah. the sort of kichidi would be like more like pilau. And you can have, yeah. A, yeah, you can have a vegetarian pilau or you can have like with meat. And, yeah. um, and then the, um, sorry, how do I say the greens dish? It's, it's called sukuma. Sukuma is, uh, is, is, uh, kale or, or collard greens, so sukuma wiki. It's mm -hmm. just a, um, it's just a little, like a stir fry almost, right? And you know how quickly, I mean, collard greens take longer to cook than yeah. kale. Yeah. Kale kind of disintegrates a little bit, like it becomes softer more quickly. So yeah. depending on which green you use, um, it has slightly different flavors, but the lemon is really important, right? You kind of just squish some lemon on it. Um, so it gives it that nice kind of freshness. Um, it's, it's, and they do, they, they're very much, you know, like I think because of um, uh, trade, a lot of Arabs and a lot of, you know, there was a lot of migration, you know, mm -hmm. to throw, um, you know, from East Africa, along Asia, and, you know, it's a full journey, right? So, and mm -hmm. also, you know, when I talked about Zanzibar as being a spice island, you know, there was a lot of trade in those spices, right? Going back and forth. So there was a lot of melting of um, cuisines, right? Long yeah. before we talk about, you know, uh, the global trade that we're talking about now and uh, American style trade, you mm -hmm. know, global experiences were being shared. Music and food and spices were all being shared, right? So. I think um, there is definitely in East Africa an influence um, of, of these other cultures in the local food, right? For and sure. It's still, there's a fusion there, and you can tell when you eat it. I suspect the same is true in the Caribbean. Now, yeah, Maxine, are you, are you from Barbados? Yes, the family's from Barbados, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I visited Barbados, like, for sure, like some of your chickpea curries, you know, some of your rotis, all those things it's just fusion right it's, mm -hmm. a lot of it, it's shared yeah yeah Rada, I swear I could talk to you for the rest of the afternoon, but I just took a peek at our time <laughs> and we are just at 1230. So I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation. You. You've thank definitely you. given us all like so much food for thought and the pun was intended. <laughs> yeah. um, well, well, thank, thank you, Maxine. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, I hope to continue this conversation uh, in uh, you know months and years to come. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we do have um, a, a Rada's recipe for the kitchidi that we will share. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, you just had a thank you for sharing your wonderful food story. I really enjoyed hearing about your experiences and I learned a lot. That was one of our comments. Um, and I agree. Thank you so much. So for the month of August, food stories, we have, so we have so far seven food stories in our repertoire. And so over the month of August, we invite everyone to check out those uh, past stories, uh, to learn about uh, different people and their different spaces in our food scene and our food culture. Uh, we have a lot of variety from, um, from the people who participated. So uh, if you go to our YRFN York Region Food Network YouTube uh, channel, you will come in contact with our um, with our food stories, and they are going to be posted there. So over the 
of August. We won't have any new sessions. We're going to resume again in September, uh, but do please check out the past sessions that we have. I'm going to say thank you again to Rada. It was amazing. You. Enjoy thank your you. lunch. <laughs> thank you, my dear. Thank and you. And we will see you again soon. Bye, everybody. Okay, bye. Bye.